Hey, good morning, church. Thanks for joining us again as we are worshiping, where the worship hasn't stopped. Uh, continue that as we look at God's Word. And uh, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 17 as we continue our series called Overcomer. So you might want to find your way there to uh, Revelation 17. Uh, it's almost to the end of the Bible. Uh, let me just remind you of a few things that uh, Chrissy talked about early on that maybe you joined us late. Uh, a couple of pertinent points for you. Uh, there's Holy Week activities going on, and uh, there is uh, Easter services, our Easter services, and people are already signed up for those uh, services, so uh, I want to encourage you to do that as they fill, because we do have to reduce capacity um, uh, because of the season that we're in, but our plan is, as services fill, um, to be able to, to add another one for you to be a part of. Of course, there will be a, at some point in time, we're going to run out of Easter. So uh, there's only so many services we can add. But just wanted you just to be aware of that, uh, that you're going to want to get on that and reserve your, uh, your, your, your space here for Easter. We're excited that we get to gather on the day. And then you, you're going to hear some, uh, some, some information about, hey, so then what about after Easter? Yeah, we we're, we got a plan that's brewing, and uh, we'll fill you, in, fill you in on those details later. And also just a reminder that, um, hey, we've been blessed to have interpreters with us for our uh, our deaf community. And as was mentioned, that uh, next week we're making a shift where, you know, it's kind of hard for them to just focus on a little square in the bottom right-hand corner. We need to make that picture big and make my picture small. And uh, so we're, we're making a shift for them. So if you're wondering, hey, what happened, uh, that that's what's going on. We want to make sure that they've got the best uh, possible way to engage in what God is saying to us in these days. So just a couple of those uh, informational things for you that uh, from the outset. And uh, let's just dive into Revelation 17 here and begin by just saying, some of you remember the name Matt Boda. Matt was a pastor here at Salem Alliance uh, some years ago and a friend of mine. And I remember one time being in a conversation with him and he was dropping some parenting pearls of wisdom. Uh, he's got his kids, he's got his family in his house, and they're watching a show. And you know, as a parent, you can, you can control what shows that your kids are watching. But when the commercials were coming on, that, those things you can't control. They're just coming at you. And, and Matt noticed that his kids were at times paying more attention to the commercials than they actually were to the show. And he was concerned about some of the messages in the commercials. And so he created a game. The game was called, What's the Lie? Watch the commercial, what's the light? It's a, it's a truck or car commercial, maybe it's a beer commercial, maybe it's a, it's a pharmaceutical company or you know what, whatever it is. What's the lie that's being presented here? Commercial ends and everyone shouts out there what the lie was and there's some laughter in the room and then boom, the next commercial is, is starting. And I, mean, I just thought that was brilliant. And I had a couple of my kids that already left the house and so I started to play that game every once in a while in our house as well. Just that, you know, there's... There's a lot of uh, deception in some of these commercials, and sometimes like, what in the world are they selling anyways? But hey, I'm setting that all up for you because we're going to play the game. What's the lie? You're going to see a commercial here, and I want you to be thinking about, okay, so what's the lie here? So here's your first commercial. See if you can pick it up. What's the lie? Each morning I get up, I die a little. Can't barely stand on my feet. Take a look at yourself, look in the mirror, and cry. And cry. Oh, what you doing? Yeah, yeah. I spent all my years believing you. I just can't get no Somebody, somebody, anybody find me, somebody to Introducing the all-new Ridgeline, the only truck with an available truck bed audio system, a new truck to love, from Honda. All right, what's the lie? Yeah, obviously, you know, sheep can't sing, dogs don't talk, that, that, but no, there's a, there's, a, there's a deeper message there, and this is, the, here's the lie. Nobody wants to hear your music when you're driving into the neighborhood out of the back of your truck. I mean, come on, people. That, that, that drives people crazy. That, that, that's the, that, that's the lie. I mean, that's just, that, you know, it's cute. It's funny in the, in the, in the commercial. But here, here's a short little, little commercial. See if you can pick up the lie here. 
award-winning actor, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Every actor, at some point, considers selling out. No, I, I would never tarnish my name by uh, selling you something. Not at all. Really? Look, let's just face it. I mean, every celebrity at some point in time does sell out. I mean, people, they, they, they're in love with money. I mean, that, that, that's the lie. People do sell out. Look, here's the point. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of deception. There's a lot of untruths, mistruths, white lies that are out there. But I don't know if you've noticed this because there's just kind of this snowball effect to deception. And it's actually got to this point where, man, now, now it's become pretty significant. And talk about scams. People are being scams and deceived. And uh, one of my kids not too long ago was selling their house. Uh, they're, they're, they're moving out of their house. And as they're packing and moving, uh, people are showing up to their place. And they're there to pick up a washing machine that they had purchased on Craigslist. They prepaid a couple hundred bucks for this washing machine. But what they were surprised to hear is that yeah, my, my kid wasn't selling their washing machine. Other people showed up to buy furniture, couches, chairs, and someone had discovered that a house had been sold and someone was moving and put these posts on uh, Craigslist. Great prices. You prepay. Just come over and pick it up. And the look of just loss in their eyes, they realized they were scammed. They got duped. They got lied to, and they lost a couple hundred bucks. And some of those scams are bigger. I was reading a story about a family that was really excited about getting the entire family together. Moms and dads, you know, kids and aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas and cousins and second cousins, kissing cousins. They're just, they're all getting together and there's this destination vacation that's planned in Florida. You got family who've bought tickets, they're flying from California, others coming from Chicago, some coming from Jersey, and they're all going down to Florida. And the mom who put it all together gets down there to pick up the confirmation packet, and when she pulls up to the address, she realizes there's no massive house for the whole family to reunite in in this destination vacation. She's literally lost thousands of dollars. And this mom says that, but when I pulled up and I saw that I had been scammed, my heart sank down to my ankles. I just got this massive pit in my stomach. I had been duped. Just say the name Bertie Madoff, and you know that he made off with billions of dollars of people's life savings. People who thought they were tucking some money away for a rainy day, or they were putting some money away for that day that they couldn't work anymore, or they didn't want to work anymore, and they could enter into a retirement season. And then they find out that they have been scammed. All that investment, all that saving of that precious hard-earned money, gone. Because they had been duped, they had been scammed, they had been lied to. Friends, as we get to Revelation chapter 17, here's what I want you to know. Here's just sort of the, the main idea, the big idea of all I'm trying to say today is, is simply this. Satan is the ultimate scam artist. He's the ultimate scam artist. His native tongue, the first language that he speaks is lying, deception. He's duping, he's scamming people. And he exists. This is his mission statement, to steal, kill, and destroy. And he is duping people. And I'm telling you that the end, if we get to the end of Revelation, what we're going to see is that look of loss in someone's eyes. They realize, ah, oh, I, I just got sucked into this. Or that, that's that, that heart sinking into the ankles or that pit in the stomach or that, oh, my goodness, I have been just misled in a way that I've never even thought I could be misled. Satan is the ultimate scam artist. And what I want to do today is I look through Revelation chapter 17. We're going to read uh, portions from this chapter. I want to highlight for us three lies. Three lies that come right from this text. And then I want to talk about just two ways that we can move forward uh, in this. Uh, and we're really avoid being scammed. D d avoid being scammed by the one who is the ultimate scam artist, whose native tongue is lying, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And so if you've got your Bibles, let's look at Revelation chapter 17. I want to jump in right away and just read the first two verses for us um, as we expose these, these, uh, these three lies. Revelation 17 verse 1, one of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, 
And I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. Well, let's just stop here. A little context for us. Um, you're going to see some pretty uh, graphic imagery in this chapter. Uh, you're going to be introduced to a, a, a prostitute. Uh, in some of your translations, it will say harlot. Well, let's just call it the spirit of Babylon. And the roots of this whole spirit of Babylon is a story found in Genesis chapter 11. It's the Tower of Babel. Uh, the breaking, cutting edge of technology in Genesis chapter 11 was the brick. Uh, you know, bake bricks and you can build something. And in Genesis chapter 11, there are people who are saying, let's build a massive tower and let's make a great name for ourselves. I encourage you to read the story, but what's happening here is you have people who belong to God and instead of making a great name for God, instead of imaging him and representing him to the world, they have turned the focus on themselves. And this is the spirit of Babylon. And so when you actually get to the actual nation of Babylon, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, this is alive and well. And by the way, you'll see this spirit just reproducing itself. Uh, it's, it's evangelizing and making disciples, and it just shows up all throughout human history. People turning focus to themselves, trying to make a great name for themselves, grabbing onto power, grabbing onto control, pursuing self-pleasure. And it shows up and it shows up today in cities all around the world like Mumbai and Dubai and Kuala Lumpur and New York and San Francisco. It's everywhere. It's pervasive. This is what Revelation chapter 17 will refer to as the great harlot or the or, or the prostitute the spirit of Babylon. And if you notice that uh, in these first two verses, um, the, the kings of this world and the people of this world, uh, they, they belong to the world. And so here's our, here's our first lie. The first lie is simply this. Look, you're the captain of your soul, so do as you please. It, it, the lies inspire from the poem Invictus, right? You're the, you're the master of your own faith, the captain of your soul, so do as you please. Look, you're in charge. You call the shots. You be you. I mean, don't let someone else put their beliefs, don't let someone else put their, uh, their convictions or their desires on you. You be you. You, you do as you please. It's, this is your life. Friends, this is the oldest lie in the book. This is the Garden of Eden. This is Eve at the tree and, and the snake, the serpent slithering up and whispering in Eve's ear. Did God really say you can't eat that you, and you would die? Is, did God really? Look, he's holding out on you. He knows that if you do eat, then your eyes are going to, you're going to have revelation. Your eyes are going to open. You're going to have insight. And he's trying to control you and he's putting his, his, you know, his grit on you and Man, do what you please. Take the fruit. It's the oldest lie in the book. You're the captain of your soul. Do as you please. Don't let other people tell you what to do. You be you. You call the shots. And friends, uh, this, this metaphor of adultery is brought into the conversation. And it, that theme is a hyperlink theme to the Old Testament. God uses this idea of adultery and that, you know, God's people belong to him and they're giving themselves to idolatry and he's calling them to repentance and he's saying, actually, you're engaged in adultery, a spiritual adultery. You belong to me and you're giving yourself to false gods. And we need to think that in, in Revelation chapter 17, they belong to this world and they're committing adultery with this, the spirit of Babylon. And friends, you can't commit adultery unless you belong to someone. I mean, to engage in intimacy, physical, sexual intimacy with someone and not be married, that, that's, the Bible calls that fornication. There's your awesome Bible word for the day. But in order to have the, the sin of adultery be committed, you actually have to belong to someone else and betray them and give yourself to someone else that you do not belong to. And that's exactly the language that's being used here in Revelation chapter 17. Look, you're... You belong to God. Friends, the reason that you have breath in your lungs, 
The reason you are able to grab perhaps a coffee cup this morning and drink it and taste coffee, the reason that you're able to go for a walk, the reason that you're able to stand on a mountainside and just take in the beauty of a, a, a mountain, uh, just the, the landscape, and, and the, the reason that you're able to put your toes in the sand at the beach or to watch a sunset and enjoy all the colors of, the, of this engaging sunset is because there's a creator. And he's created you, he's created me, he's created us. And as Jeremiah the prophet says, look, the clay doesn't tell the potter how to do things. Yeah, so, but he, he, here's, here's the spirit of Babylon, though. The spirit of Babylon is saying that exact thing. Look, you're the captain of your soul. Do as you please. I mean, you call the shots, you're in charge. Friends, as we get to the end of this series, The Overcomer, and we get to the, the final chapters, which I can't wait until we do get there, what we're going to discover is people who've bought into this lie, they're going to have a look of loss in their eyes. Their hearts are going to drop into their ankles and be a pit in their stomach. And they've been duped, and people are being duped. What's the lie? You're the captain of your soul. You call, you call the shops. You do as you please. And the reality is, is that we are the created. There is a creator. And actually, it's a beautiful thing to submit to his leadership. That's line number one. Line number two, uh, we'll take it from the text. I want to read verses three through six for us from Revelation chapter 17. I will keep picking it up here. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. And there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns, and blasphemies against God were written all over it. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. Lie number one, you're the captain of your soul. Just do as you please. Lie number two, I can satisfy all your desires. I... I Every craving you got, I, I can satisfy you. L look at the picture we're given of the spirit of Babylon. Uh, she's wealthy. She's got all kinds of, uh, of, of wealth. She looks, she looks royal. She's got gems, precious jewels that she's wearing. She's got a cup. Notice it's not a scepter. This is an authority. It's a cup. It's it's. You know, it's enjoying life, it's, it's partying, it's, it's, it's like enjoying all that there is, and she's, and she's drunk. We'll, we'll, t we'll talk about what that means, but she, she's got everything, and friends, this lie is the siren's call. I can satisfy all your desires. And Greek mythology teaches us about the sirens. They're these creatures who live on this island. They sing this beautiful song, and sailors are sucked in by the beauty of the music, but their, their, their lives are crashed on the rock. And there's two people who were able to pass by this island without being sucked in. You, you've, you've got Odysseus who actually has to be physically restrained and all the sailors on his ship have to have you know, things in their ears to block out the sound of the siren. And there's Orpheus who actually then sings a greater song to, to, to kind of cover out the volume of the siren's call. That, that's what this is. It's like the siren's call. It's like, look, I can satisfy all your desires. Wealth, beauty, Joy, pleasure, it's everything you dreamed of. I, I, I can give it to you. And the reality is, is that if you look at people who have all that, you don't see satisfaction. You don't see contentment. You look at people who have beauty and have... Think of the lives of those who have taken their lives out of despair and anxiety because of all that they... I mean, names like Anthony Bourdain, Kate Spade. Or just think about maybe some... Call it wisdom by the great theologian Jim Carrey. Just, just kidding. But I think we got something to learn from Jim as he says these words. He says, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they've ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. 
Oh, but that's the lie, right? I mean, you acquire, you accumulate, you, I mean, it's the cars, it's the houses, it's the brands, it's the man, it's the woman, it's, uh, it's, it's the bank account, it's, I mean, it's the, it's, it's all of it. If I could just have that, then I would be satisfied. Again, friends, this is one of the oldest lies in the book. Jesus, he's being tempted in the wilderness. He's just been baptized in water and in the spirit. And then Satan comes up to him as he's fasting and says, look, look, all this, these rocks out here. I mean, imagine if they were loaves of bread. Uh, don't think for a minute that Jesus in his own humanity, I mean, he's laid aside his divine prerogatives, that he doesn't look around and see a bunch of wonder bread everywhere. And, and Satan's like, it just, you can turn a stone into bread. Come on. He's appealing to his appetites. What does Jesus do? Oh, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Well, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Satan changes his, scat, his, his, his tactics. And he goes, look, let's, highest point in the temple, throw yourself off. Because Psalm 91 says your angels are going to they're gonna protect you. And Jesus says, well, let me, let, me just, you know, let me just read to the end of Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. You know, don't put the Lord your God to a test. And Satan is trying to scam Jesus because Satan is the ultimate scam artist. Lying is his thing. It's his native tongue. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So one more, one more try. Jesus, if you bow down to me, all the splendor. High mountain he's on. Look at all the kingdoms of this world. All the splendor. This could be yours. Just bow down and worship me. See, Satan is tempting Jesus' appetites. He's tempting Jesus with the affirmation of people. Do something spectacular. And this last one, he's appealing to his ambitions. You can, you can be top rung. Just worship me. It's yours. And so what does Jesus do? He quotes Deuteronomy 6. And he says, now, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Get away from me, Satan. It, see, Satan is he's the ultimate scam artist. The serpent is the, is the ultimate liar, and he's, and he's speaking this lie of, look, I can satisfy your desires. And friends, can I just say here just for a moment that, you know what, desire is not a bad thing. There are actually religious systems that are out there that say, like, consider Buddhism, for example. It says the reason we have so much suffering in our world is because there's so many desires. So if we can just get rid of desire, then we can get rid of suffering. That's, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus actually put these desires in us. Look, he put the desire for, for hunger, for thirst and, and since we're talking about the spirit of Babylon, who's a harlot and a, and a prostitute, yes, even things like sexual desire, sexual intimacy, intimacy, that's a gift. He's given us this desire. And isn't it interesting in our day and age that out of one corner of the mouth, the spirit of the Babylon, spirit of Babylon says, you know, sex is nothing. I mean, just do as you please. You're the captain of your own soul. And you can just have that kind of intimacy as many people as you want. It's okay. Yet out of the other side of their mouth, they're saying sexuality is everything. Is it nothing or is it everything? I'm confused. But this, this is the, con, the, the contrary message of the spirit of Babylon. Jesus actually says he planted sexual desire. He put that in us and said, look, and here's the best way to use this gift. It's in marriage. It's between a man and a woman in, 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 in marriage and in the covenant of marriage and and. I just want you to know God's not against desire. He actually has given us these desires. The problem is our desires are disordered. But there is a king who wants to teach us and show us how to put our desires in order because that's actually the best thing for us. Yet, Satan's the ultimate scam artist, and he's lying and he's deceiving and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's going to tell people, you know what? You're the captain of your soul. Do as you please. I can satisfy all your desires. And that's a lie. And there are going to be a lot of people who are going to have a look of loss in their eyes one day. Their heart's going to fall into their ankles. They're going to have this pit in their stomach. This hope they've had uh, that is going to be robbed from them. And yet there's still one more lie. Let's continue in Revelation 17 and keep looking here. 
Um, I, I'm going to pick up the reading in verse 15, but let me just kind of, verses 7 through 14 are all about, it, it's, it's a lot of information about uh, this woman who sits on seven hills and kings and who are the horns. And um, you know, there have been a lot of scholars who tried to figure this out uh, for a lot of years. The seven hills, that well, that we know Rome, that seven hills of Rome, that, that's talking about that. But, you know, who are these emperors? Who are these kings? Some, some of that, well, it's got to be talking about the Roman Empire. Some think it's about empires yet to come. We don't know. We just got to remind ourselves that revelation is not a riddle to be solved. This is about Jesus and about teaching us how to overcome. So uh, that, that's those, those middle verses. But let me just pick it up in verse 15 as we expose this last lie. Then the angel said to me, the waters where the prostitute is ruling represent masses of people of every nation and language. The scarlet beast and his ten horns all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. They will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast. And so the words of God will be fulfilled. And this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of this world. What's the lie? The the rely is simply this. Resistance is useless. Look, just relax. Give in. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, you should enjoy life. I mean, it's it's, it's just the way things are. We're, We're progressing. We're, we're, we're making gains, and that's, that's kind of medieval, old-time thinking. This is, this is who we are, and I just relax, enjoy life. And, you know, from our vantage point, perhaps, we look at what's happening in our world, and we see things, and, and man, it's just, it's, it's, it seems like, it, how, do we, how do we move forward in it? Things, there's, the problems are there, but they're big problems. I mean, you're driving down the street and you're seeing folks who are talking to themselves and it seems like mental illness is at an all-time high. And it just seems like an impossible situation to, to, to see healing in. We look at uh, the, the, the racial tension in our world, in our country. Think about the news from this past week of uh, the, the grief flowing out of the Asian community as, as women are, are, are shot in, in Atlanta. And, um, and we, we just think about, man, this, this conversation is just so huge. Can, can there ever really be racial healing? We look at the political tensions. We look at the global uh, tension. Look at disease. It's like, when is this going to end, this whole COVID thing? And the problems look so huge, and it's almost like you just want to throw up your hands and go, can we even make a difference? Friends, can I tell you this? There is a king who is returning. The king of kings and lord of lords is coming back. In Revelation chapter 17, he says he's coming back with those who belong to him. And the lamb, notice the lamb, not the lion, the lamb, yes, he's the lion from the tribe of Judah, but he comes and he returns as the lamb and evil is destroyed. And in the passage that we read, actually, you've got this spirit of Babylon riding on a beast and evil implodes on itself. The beast actually attacks this woman riding her and it's like evil, it just implodes on itself. And we look at our world and we see all the impossible situations. You're looking at the impossible situations perhaps from your own vantage point in your own circumstances and you're wondering, will there ever be breakthrough or can there be breakthrough? And friends, can I just tell you this? Resistance is not useless. There is a God of the impossible And evil will not rule and reign forever. It will not rule the day. There is a king who is righteous who is returning. In the meantime, he's called us to represent him. And we, the church, are the coming attraction of what the kingdom of heaven looks like when it's fully realized. We're We're the preview to the movie. That's who we're called to be in the meantime. Yet, Satan is the ultimate scam artist. His lying is his native tongue. And his mission statement, he exists to steal, kill, and destroy. 
So his lies are out there. You're the captain of your soul. Do as you please. You call the shots. You're in charge. Don't let other people tell you what to do. I could satisfy your desires. People are buying into that. Resistance is useless. But the truth is that Jesus modeled for us that, no, actually, we can resist the devil, and he will flee. That actually he is living water, and he can satisfy our every thirst. And actually he is Lord, and he knows what's best for us, and he actually wants the best for us. So how do we avoid being scammed? Let, let me just give you a couple of ways to, to move, move, move us forward. Uh, first one, simply this. Remember the greater than principle. The greater than. Let me, let me explain this. This comes from 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 to 5. Some of your translations just say, well, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Let me, let me read that passage for us from 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 4 and 5, and um, you'll, you'll, get a, you'll get a chance to hear this. It'll be on the screen for you. Uh, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. The part I want to hone in here is greater is he that's in you that's in, than he that's in the world. See, here's sometimes what we do. The lies are out there. The siren's call is being sung. And so we're trying to muster up all the willpower that we can. And we want to try harder. And we're just, like, you know, we're exerting holy sweat. And then we find ourselves stuck in the same patterns that we've been stuck in. And friends, the answer is not trying harder. The answer is, remember, the greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So what we need to do is dive deeper into the spirit. We need to be filled and empowered because we don't have the strength. But God does. And so we remember the greater than principle and we pursue and we drink from the spirit. We spend time alone. We have times of private worship. We have times of private listening with God. We invest in that, that relationship individually and then collectively. Many of you are doing that collectively today in a house church. You're, you're doing it. This isn't about more exertion. This is about Drinking deeper from the one who truly satisfies our thirst. It's a call to the deeper life. That's a, I think that's the first way that we can avoid being scammed because the more we drink deeply and are satisfied in the spirit, the less we'll be lured by the siren's call and then tempted to give our allegiance to someone who it doesn't belong to. That's the first one. Here's the a, here's a second one. Learn the language of Scripture. We've been talking about this. Marinate in Scripture. You know, you learn language by immersing yourself in it. And notice again that when Jesus, who says to Satan, you know, get away from me, he's quoted Scripture three times. He's speaking the language of Scripture. And the spirit of Babylon, who offers wealth and beauty and all this pleasure, notice that in chapter 17, where she is, she's actually in the wilderness. It's arid, it's dry, it shrivels you up. And when the temptations come, you can just remind her of that, remind the scam artist of that by speaking the language of Scripture. Now, this led Jesus into the missional life. He comes through the temptations, and then his ministry begins, and he goes to a synagogue, and he opens a scroll, and he reads from Isaiah, and then you have this ministry that leads us to Holy Week, which we're going to celebrate here very soon. But here's the point. It's learning the language of Scripture for the purpose of the missional life. Let's put the two of these together for a moment. You see, you have the deeper life, and you have the missional life. Sometimes we get focused on the missional life, but we don't have the fuel for the missional life. Sometimes we get so focused on the deeper life, and we never live out the power that we were intended to, to, to walk in. Put the two of them together, you understand that the deeper life actually is the fuel for the missional life. And I don't know if you know this or not, but our family, our denomination, the Christian Missionary Alliance, that is the roots of our beginnings. The founder of our movement actually had two groups of people. They had this, this thing called the, the, the Christian Alliance. This was all focused on deeper life, going deeper in the spirit. 
And then there was this other group that was called the, it was, just, it was all focused on international missions. And, and there was these two separate societies or groups. And, and then he put them together. It, it became the Christian and Missionary Alliance. That, that's our family. And I don't, that, this is late 1800s. Do you know that today there are 22,000 Alliance churches all around the world? And there are 6.2 million people who are part of Alliance churches globally. And for over 100 years, the good news of the kingdom has been preached. The sick have been healed and demons have been cast out as the kingdom of God has been advancing. And friends, it was the deeper life combined with the missional life. Now imagine this. Imagine you and I going deep, satisfied, content, in all that has God, God has for us, and then living out the missional life that God has for us. Imagine what might happen in your neighborhood. Imagine what would happen in our city. Imagine what could happen in our nation, in our world. I'm going to tell you what would happen. Lies would be exposed. The scam artists would be exposed. And there would be an awakening like no other. So the invitation for us is, are we going to believe the lies? Or are we going to go deep and live out the call that God has in our life? Let's pray about that. So, Father, we thank you that you are truth. And that you speak words of life and truth to us. And that your desire for us is that we might experience the abundant life. You don't want to steal from us. You, you, don't, want, you, you don't want something that, that, you know, to hide something from us. You actually have given us so much. You are a blesser. You are generous. And we thank you that you are our God. Now, expose the lies, Lord, that we've bought into. Reveal the ways that maybe we, we've been calling our own shots and been going into life thinking that we're, I mean, I'm in charge. I'm the captain of my soul. Expose that to us. Uh, you don't want to shame us or condemn us. You just want to have us walk in the light as you're in the light. Uh, expose the ways, Lord, that we've sought contentment in things that are not you. And where there's despair, would you give birth to hope? Would you shine your light and cause hope to rise in our hearts? Oh, Lord, people today, they need, they need to know that joy is possible, that hope is possible. Yet all the circumstances around us as we read news or we hear stories or we go to social media or we even see Christians attacking Christians. Oh, Lord, it seems like the enemy is having a heyday. Would you give birth to hope once again in us and help us to see that actually, no, we're surrounded by a great army of heaven. Greater is he that's in us than he's in the world. Thank you, God, for being with us and revealing your heart to us. We pray this now in your name. Amen.